Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. For those who have been tuning along uh, all month long, we've been celebrating the adventure of a new year. So we've been connecting with uh, scientists and explorers uh, from all over the world uh, who get out, who explore, who try new things. Uh, they've been teaching us all kinds of great lessons about taking risks and resiliency, goal setting, and the like. And we're really excited today. Today, we're going to be joined uh, by Hugh James. He was an active climber, mountaineer, endurance athlete, and all-around adventurer. He combines all of these interests to create a unique approach to getting people of all ages excited about the universe and the natural world. He's a trained mountain leader and a winter mountaineer in Scotland and the Alps. He's also the founder of an awesome organization called Anturis with a goal of enthusing children and adults alike in science through expeditions. So he wants to have all people live and learn through adventure. So Hugh, it's so great to have you joining us live today. Uh, we've got some great classrooms joining us and I'm sure they'll have some awesome questions when the time comes. Thanks for the amazing introduction, I appreciate it. All right, my pleasure. Well, uh, you're a veteran of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We've had you back multiple times. We love having you and I'm um, looking forward to- more in 2019? Yeah, absolutely. Right, should we get started? Let's do it. Perfect. All right. So uh, thank you so much for, for joining everybody. Uh, currently, I'm in Wales in the UK, which is uh, the lesser known country of all the uh, the countries in the UK. It's not Scotland, Ireland or England. It's a, a whole one by itself, but from a Celtic background. So I spent a lot of my time kind of growing up in uh, the valleys in, in South Wales, which is a, a, a mining community. So uh, my grandfather and, and his uh, parents would have been coal miners, uh, would have worked in the mines. And at one point, Wales was one of the richest countries in the world. We, we put a lot of um, work and effort into uh, mining coal uh, and shipping that off to countries around the world, including the uh, United States and Canada. Um, obviously, uh, a lot of that was uh, a risky endeavor. Uh, the explorers uh, of my generations in, or, or my generation before me in Wales would have done that for, for for gains so they would have done that to kind of make money but nowadays a lot of the explorers that we find do it because they want to find you know new geographical places they want to go somewhere and find new things or they want to explore new cultures or they want to uh, go somewhere and learn something new and that's really what i love about uh, exploration is the learning of new things and that doesn't need to be something that's new to humankind that can be something that's new to uh, you uh, and yourself. So whenever you're going out to kind of on big adventures, and I agree 2019 is going to be a, an amazing year of, of adventure, um, learning new things is always something that, that I'm really kind of passionate about. So uh, in fact, I'm only here for a couple more days in Wales and I go off to France uh, learning some new kind of skills in ski touring and, and be able to access new areas uh, in mountainous regions around the world. So always trying to, to learn something new and I know that in your schools, you'll be learning new things uh, all the time. And I really uh, miss school. Uh, I miss my, my teachers and my, and my lecturers because um, there's when you go into to work, sometimes this you spend less of your time learning new things. So it's really a privilege to kind of spend all of your day <laughs> in, a, in a school learning new things. So I wanted to, to share a, a few of these things that I've learned over the, over the years with with you guys uh, and um, I'll share my screen uh, for this bit uh, so that you can you can see some of those things too. So uh, over the last couple of years I've spent a lot of time uh, in remote regions or regions that are kind of less traveled by others um, and making sure that I, I try and find wherever possible uh, those new ways to learn. So oh, let me change that back to this one. Perfect. Uh, and my day job really is to um, try my best to explain difficult things to understand in a really simple way. So I spend a lot of my time doing puzzles, whether that's um, in a way of uh, breaking down kind of climate change and, and that kind of science uh, for, uh, for, for teachers and for students, or whether it's kind of going new places and finding out how I best uh, logistically work out an expedition. So how do we kind of move people from one place to another? How do we risk assess those areas? Because some of the places can be quite risky. One of the ones that I, I enjoy spending lots of time on, I go back mostly every year, uh, is the Solheim Yokel. Uh, and this 
the Solheimer Yockel is, and if I just draw this on for you guys uh, to see, is this little area down here. This is the Solheimer Yockel. Just above that little laser pointer, a few pixels across, is a, a big, big glacier. And I've been going back to, to find it because uh, it's actually disappearing quite a lot. So um, these, these pictures are about 10 years apart. Uh, and you can see how much this glacier is actually disappearing. And every time I go back, uh, there's further to walk to get to that um, to get to that glacier and stand on it. And in fact, if you take lots of pictures and put them together side by side, uh, you end up with something that looks a bit like this. Uh, and over time, what we find is that the the whole area, the whole front of this, starts to disappear. Uh, so this is from the Extreme Ice Survey, and the Extreme Ice Survey uh, is a, a great documentary that you guys can uh, can watch uh, online. Uh, it's called Chasing Ice, and they did a, a time lapse, which is what this type of uh, photography and filmmaking is. They take a picture, maybe every day or maybe every week, and put those together um, to show what happens over maybe a six or ten year period. And uh, you can see that the the Solheim Yorkel is one of the fastest retreating glaciers in the world they've got this big glacial lagoon down the bottom then here which gets bigger and bigger every time i go back to it um and you can see the difference from where that red line is where the glacier used to be and as we go back in time it moves up towards that red line and then as you go forward in time again we end up going right up to where we are today uh, and the the that particular glacier the solheim yokel uh, we did some some drone work of recently, and you can really kind of tell how much that's gone back up in the the top bit up here. You can see where the glacier used to be. It's, it's rubbed all this rock all along here, rubbed all that rock away, uh, and it's slowly starting to to disappear and head up into the mountains uh, there. And in fact, when we were there last time, um, we were filming on it, uh, and this big bit of ice came off uh, and started floating away. You can see people taking selfies. We're taking pictures of in the wrong direction all the actions happening in the other direction over there uh, this big chunk of ice carved off uh, and headed down into the glacial lagoon and eventually then down into the uh, into the ocean so this is uh, important because as glaciers shrink as ice caps shrink we get access to different parts of it as they as they carve off we call it over the front we get access to different parts of it so um what we end up with and i'm just going to change my screen up for you guys to look at a different part um as we uh, get this new ice a lot of time what we'll end up with is we'll get new access to new bits of information uh, that we've never seen before all right so the ice is going to reveal uh, a new bit of ice so here's a, a good bit uh, for you guys to have a look at. Here we go. Oh, let me just change that up because that's the one. Uh, that's the one I want to do. Perfect. So this one, this all these little bubbles in. I'm going to share that with you guys there. Let's share that. That's the one I want to see. So this uh, in this glacial region, as new bits of uh, ice carve off, uh, we get access to bubbles that are trapped in the ice, and that that is the the new types, uh, the sorry the atmosphere from long long time ago. So all these little bubbles that you can see trapped in the ice, all of that uh, is atmosphere from long time ago. And climate scientists are looking at new ways uh, uh, to measure the atmosphere from a long time ago. And we've had times in the past where we've had lots and lots and lots of snow and ice on the earth called snowball earth. We've had times in the past where we've had lots and lots of, um, or sorry, not so much ice. Uh, in fact, sometimes none at all. And that's a, a greenhouse earth. But these climate scientists are in these uh, places like Antarctica, where they've got to collect this kind of information. And what that means is uh, sometimes they're in risky places you know i go to these places too uh, and sometimes it's so cold that your eyeballs can freeze at about minus 50 degrees celsius uh, and that's not a good thing no one wants their eyeballs freezing up so they've got to take precautions at all time but 
The most important thing to remember is that instead of being risk averse, which means avoiding all risk, you can be risk aware at all times. And uh, I train quite a lot to make sure that I'm always aware of the risk that's around, not always that I um, I avoid it. I don't always avoid risk. Sometimes you have to take some risks, but you must always be aware of those risks and, and the certain outcomes that you can get with it. Nowhere, nowhere was that more evident than when I went to the, the Amazon jungle a couple of years ago. I spent time there with 50 students uh, and a bunch of leaders, and we spent time looking at deforestation. So I'm sure you guys are learning about this at the moment, uh, places where we used to have uh, jungle uh, and the tropics around the equator uh, are a big part of that, uh, where we used to have jungle and now we're starting to get uh, more urbanization, more uh, towns and cities and people living. Uh, and over the course of uh, 30 or 40 years, what we're finding is that we're losing uh, lots of that jungle. So use a comparison side by side from 1975 uh, all the way to 2001. So over the course of say 26 years, uh, we see in pristine jungle change into an environment where humans can live, which isn't always bad. Humans need places to live. Uh, there wasn't always people that lived in Canada. There wasn't always people that lived in America or the UK or wherever else. We, we changed the environment to let us live in it. But what that does mean is that well, there's less trees, there's less habitat for wildlife. Um, I was recently in uh, Hong Kong and uh, we saw uh, these monkeys. And they were living in a habitat where uh, lots, of, lots of cars would go past, lots of uh, people would live there. Uh, and we're really looking for these environments where humans live together with uh, with animals and trying to find out what happens there. So when we were in the jungle, we'd use these camera traps to try and find those animals and find out what happens to them. Uh, if they are still around, if they go away, when humans come onto the land. And we were in an area which used to be, uh, used to have a farmland on it. So have humans and cows and sheep and the likes. And now we'd, um, we're trying to find out what animals live there now. So we're trying to, to, to find out uh, if it's as good as jungle as it used to be. So we use these camera traps. And normally on these camera traps, you find your own face. Uh, a lot of time you end up getting lots of pictures of yourself. Or you end up with pictures of uh, animals walking off into the distance and just getting the bums of the animals. That one's a tapir wandering off into the distance back there. But what, what we try and do is uh, film these animals and try and find out what kinds of animals live there. So the snakes live in that part of the jungle. And we found out that they actually do uh, live in that part of the jungle. So in the Amazon jungle in South America, lots and lots of different types of snakes. We wore wellies all the time because we were worried about snakes eating our ankles. But obviously, snakes can also live in trees. These are called arboreal snakes. They live up there in the trees. Um, so that was a, a definitely a risk that we were aware of for the entire time and to to mitigate that risk to to hopefully stop that risk um, from getting worse we wore wellies there's only one uh, one snake in the jungle that could bite through a wellie uh, so we made sure that we tried to stay away from those uh, we saw lots of different types of frogs and amphibians and reptiles uh, and you can see that uh, underneath under the belly of this particular frog is quite brightly colored which normally means that it's quite a poisonous frog. This one isn't. It's called a, a monkey tree frog. It lives up there in the uh, in the trees with lots of other life, actually. Um, but we were aware of the fact that this one could be poisonous. And we, we looked it up, uh, asked one of the specialists, and it turns out that it wasn't. But then you get things like this. This is a, a bullet ant. And we did get bitten by these quite a lot. Luckily, they're not um, too venomous. But they do hurt when they bite you. They're said to be... Uh, when they bite you, it said it's like it's the pain of being shot with a bullet. Um, and I haven't been shot with a bullet yet, but I've been bitten by one of these and it definitely does hurt. But all of these gives us a, a, a health check on the jungle. So the work we were trying to do there was trying to find out how healthy the jungle is. Um, we saw lots of different types of caterpillars who turned into wonderful moths uh, and uh, butterflies, which is a great indication of how good the jungle environment is. You'd see lots of things that look quite risky, that look quite uh, dangerous, like this one. This is the Taylor Swift scorpion. Uh, 
because it looks like it doesn't look like Taylor Swift, but actually uh, it's called the Taylor Whip Scorpion, and the Taylor Whip Scorpion uh, is uh, not actually a, a scorpion at all. It's an arachnid. It's a, a spider, um, and you've got to be uh, careful of some of the spiders because some of the spiders um, can bite. Uh, some of them just throw off uh, hairs. This is Terry the tarantula that we found in camp with us. We were acting like a, an insect on the, the periphery on the outer edge of Terry's hole uh, so that Terry would come out and see us. So there's Terry. You see the hairs on the back of Terry that uh, it flicks off towards its uh, any kind of predators trying to get it. It would irritate the eyes and the ears uh, and the throat because they move really, really quickly. But actually, uh, Terry's not anyone, not a, a risky spider, uh, but these ones are, these are, these are called Brazilian wandering spiders. And Brazilian wandering spiders are known to be the most venomous spiders in the world, or the most, one of the most dangerous uh, for their venom, uh, because they don't live in a, on a, uh, a particular tree, they don't live in a hole, they don't have a, a web, they just wander around. They're called Brazilian wandering spiders. Uh, and they're very, very venomous. So we had to make sure, this is just in our camp, we had to make sure at all times we were aware of the risks, but that didn't mean that we weren't gonna do our work. We weren't gonna uh, go out there and find out what is in that jungle. And it turned out that there's a lot. So lots of big mammals, uh, different types of monkeys. Uh, also these kind of monkeys would um, be quite, well, when you encroach on their land, they would throw things at you. And the only thing they had really to throw at you was their own poo. So they'd throw those at that at you quite a lot. Uh, so these, these monkeys would wander through and they'd know which bits used to be farmland and which bits are their, their land and to get onto. So we're looking all the time to try and find out how healthy this part of the jungle is and how much humans have changed it. Uh, and it turns out that we've changed it quite a lot. Um, but what we end up with is a, a really good overview of what the, the jungle looks like. Uh, from the, the tiniest insects all the way up to the biggest mammals. Uh, and jungles are, are changing, in, in, like glaciers are changing. The whole planet is, is, is changing quite a lot. So we need more explorers to go out there and to, to take those risks, but risks that everyone's very aware of and, and do the training and find out how to do it safely um, and be risk aware to go out and, and visit these wonderful places. So I'm going back out on, on Friday to, to visit places like this, the Glacier de Tour uh, in France, because these places might not be around much longer if we don't start kind of doing more research, uh, trying to find out what, what's going on and reversing uh, the climate change that, and the, the changing environment that humans are uh, opposing on it. So part of my job really then is to, to speak to people about the changes that I see and the, the work that we do along the way uh, and try and make sure that, uh, that everyone's aware of how humans are changing the environment. Um, and I know that uh, uh, Mr. Grabowski and there are a bunch of people at National Geographic and around the world that uh, are doing what they can to make sure that your generation, the, the next generation coming up, uh, we live in a better place than we have right now, which is a, a very tough ask, a very tall order. Um, but it's one that we, that we will try and fight for uh, regardless. And um, some of that means that we're gonna have to spend lots of money on renewable energy. Some of that means we're gonna have to spend lots of money on um, making the world uh, different than how we're comfortable with it. But that's the, the risk we've got to take for making the world a better place, I suppose. Um, but it takes me to some wonderful places and I'm, I'm a very lucky person to, to get to visit them uh, whilst they still look as, as pristine as I can imagine them being, for sure. All right. Well, Hugh, thank you so much for sharing those adventures with us. I love the way that you've really combined your passions, what's happening to our planet, as well as your passions for expeditions and seeing new places, you put it into a really exciting way to educate people and not just kids, but the adults. So I think that's really important. And I will just be kids. That's right. <laughs> uh, I think um, I love your message about risks too. You shouldn't run from risks, you shouldn't avoid them, but you train, you prepare, and you're ready for them when they do come up. So thanks exactly. so much for that message today, Hugh. Pleasure. All right, well, let's meet our classroom. So I just wanna uh, give a quick shout out to 
Uh, Mrs. Woods class, I know your camera and mic aren't working today, but if you send some questions into the blue chat sidebar, I'll keep an eye out for them and I'll make sure that we get uh, them into you today. But let's go to our first live group. Let's go to British Columbia here in Canada. We've got what? some great sixes hanging out with Mrs. Caesar's class. Let's get their microphone on. How are we doing, British Columbia? Yeah. Hi. Hey. So my question is, which place is most that you've been to hit by climate change? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, and everywhere you go to, you hear stories of, of climate change. And normally when you speak to, um, for you guys, it'll be maybe your grandparents. Um, they'll tell you how it's, how it's changed from what it used to be like. Every way is impacted by climate change a little bit different. So I've just go back from the Caribbean. And we know that in the Caribbean, the, they're getting hit by more more hurricanes and stronger stronger hurricanes than, than what they used to be because uh, the way hurricanes work is that they feed off the warmth and the energy uh, in the warm waters and because the, the oceans are sucking up so much warmth because of climate change there's just more energy uh, in the environment to cause massive hurricanes so we know I've just go back um, from a bunch of different islands that are still recovering two almost two years later uh, 18 months on from uh, massive hurricanes, Irma uh, and Maria. And there's still the people's boats at the bottom of the, the harbour. Uh, there's still roofs on that disappeared off houses. There's still people that have moved away and haven't come back again. Um, so that's one way that they've been impacted by climate change. And then uh, places like Iceland, where I see the glaciers uh, and the Alps actually in, in Europe, where the glaciers are, are disappearing. You know, in places like British Columbia, it's like Alaska and Canada, the vast majority, 95% of all glaciers around the world are, are disappearing. So uh, we're all seeing it in one way, shape or form, but how we see it is, is different depending on where you go in the world. So I think the Caribbean for me is, which is a, a weird one, you expect you know, glaciers melting to be the first thing that strikes you about climate change, but you know, the wild weather we've been having across the world is, is quite stark at the moment. All right. Great question to start us off and a great point. I think there's very few people who haven't noticed the weather in their area changing or unusual patterns. Here, for instance, in Ontario, our winters just aren't as cold as they used to be. Um, they're a lot wetter. So there's definitely, definitely things are changing. And I think a lot of people are feeling those impacts. Yeah, you're exactly right. And that's a good point, uh, Mr. Grabowski, that um, sometimes it is wetter uh, in places which those glaciers that do increase in size that five percent uh, sometimes it is because it's ju they just have more precipitation more um more snow falling it doesn't mean that the earth's not warming up but it means that sometimes it just get more precipitation more rain and snow in certain places all right let's take a little journey to independence missouri we have some grade fives hanging out with mrs rimmel let's get their microphone on how are we doing grade five <laughs> July 4th is named after Independence, Missouri, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> so every July 4th is for Independence, Missouri Day. Right. right. <laughs> My question is, how long did you have to go to college to get your degree? Oh, that's a good one. Well, it, actually, in um, I actually went to, to college here in the UK. And in the UK, college is between the ages of 16 and 18. And then you go to university uh, afterwards from 18 up. And I went for four years. I did uh, astronomy and space science and some geology as well uh, for good measure because I wanted to be a, a planetary geologist. So I wanted to be someone who looked at uh, other uh, worlds, other planets, and found out how the how the the planet is different to that of earth so i was really interested in places like mars uh places like titan uh, and uh, europa moons of other uh, other planets big gas giants i was really interested in, in finding out how uh they differ to earth so why you know mars looks so different to, to earth now looks um because i think that that you know when we talk about exploration and risk nothing that embodies that better really than space exploration like how can we go out there and uh and find more than that's uh, just on earth and recently i saw an article today that um one of the 
uh, the little landers, the rovers that uh, China dropped onto the dark side of the moon, grew some uh, some uh, cotton on it. So uh, some cotton sprouted on the far side of the moon, which is which blew my mind that there's now life on the the far side of the moon. So we're getting there, and I think it's going to be your generation that um, that will have to study hard and kind of go into those fields where we can go off and you know work for NASA and go and um, explore space a little bit more. It's a bit of a longer run than uh, a, a three or four year bachelor's degree and then a, a master's and an app um, but it's well worth doing so the long answer is the short answer is four years um but the longer answer is you never really stop studying and learning things um if you study you know the stem subjects science technology engineering and mathematics you're always kind of learning and that's what i love most about my job really is that it's like still being at college all right awesome thanks for that question and absolutely lifelong learn is, is the way to go yeah for sure all right let's go to texas this time we're going to go to austin texas uh, mrs hans has some grade eights hanging out with her in the library let's get that microphone on how are we doing grade eights it's the library yeah <laughs> um so hi i'm my question is, well, actually I have a couple questions, is um, my sister studying geophysics and she was, we were talking about the risk assessment um, things, I was wondering is uh, she was thinking about using drones to go and study volcanoes and I know yep. you do drone work. Um, was there something that was like, um, would you be actually operating the drones or would um, like you be looking through the drone data and like, what is that like? Yeah, you're good. So one second, I go, this is my kit room. And I do actually have a few of my drones here. So this is uh, the one that I use is uh, called the Phantom 4. And you can get lots of data with this one. So this is, uh, the one I use, I've got a smaller version as well, um, but obviously you can get bigger versions. Uh, in the UK, you have to do a uh, pilot's course uh, to learn to use one of these. It's uh, about a, a five days long. You've got to show people that you can uh, you can fly it and land it properly and that you won't uh, actually use it in any bad ways. In the UK at the moment, we've had a few people flying them around airports, which is really bad. Um, but you can get a lot of data with these uh, and there's a lot to be said for uh, for using media in science research so films and uh, photography like just comparing satellite images or comparing drone images uh, can be really good at showing um, how an area is reacting to, to changes um, getting photographs of animals in different locations is great because um, you can show that yes they definitely are in in that area but you can actually, with these, uh, you can use certain software then to actually make a 3D model of different areas. So it's the same kind of drones that you get for commercial use. Um, but you take all that footage, you enter it into a bit of software that has a lot of computing power behind it. Uh, and you can actually 3D model and estimate the volume of how big maybe a landslide is, uh, is a good geophysics uh, problem. Like you can see how much uh, rock used to be there and how much is now further down the down the cliff? So it's really changing the way you know we we do science. This new technology. Uh, I know a, a, a lady who uses it to collect whale snot, um, which I'm sure Mr. Grosky will have on it at some point talking about how she collects whale snot using using drones. So technology really drives science, and this is a, a great new way of of doing all that work. Um, and one of the the ways that I, I hear someone doing it lately is um, putting a, an infrared camera or thermal imaging camera on it and identifying animals in places like the the, uh, the Masai Mara out in Africa. So from biology to chemistry to, to geophysics to the rest of it, technology is changing how how we do it. And you know my my field of astronomy and space science, technology has driven that whole field. So when we talk about science, we're really talking about science, technology, engineering, and math, because one can't exist without the other. We need the technology, we need the science, and all the rest of it. That's a, a great question. I'm a really big fan of uh, of drones. So, yeah. 
Hope you have a good one. All right. Awesome. Great question. And yeah. you brought up the infrared uh, cameras. I know, or I have a friend who's in Mexico and she studies spider monkeys and they're experimenting with using the drones and the infrared because it's hard to walk around and count them all. It's hard to see through the canopy. It's hard to get through the jungle, but you can count them with the cameras in the treetops. So it's a much easier way to take a look at a larger yeah. area and get a good count. For sure. All right. Uh, we're going to go to Mr. Duggan's class in just one second, but just a reminder, I know Mrs. Woods is joining us in Toronto, Ontario, so don't be shy. Send us in uh, some questions via the chat sidebar, but let's go to Mr. Duggan's group. They are joining us in Toronto as well. They're a high school class. Let's get that microphone on. Ah, uh, there it is. Hi. 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 Okay, um, how did you get into your certain like profession and career? And did you always have like an interest with um, astronomy and like science and adventure? That's a really good question. Because a lot of the time you hear those, uh, you hear people say, oh, I've always wanted to do this, or I've always wanted to do that. And I've often been jealous of, of those people. And but I, I speak to so many people who just still don't know what they want to do for a living. Um, and I think we are taught from a young age that we have to have this thing that we we want to do. We have to have a dream. We have to have goals and, and whatnot. I never really had that. Well, I didn't think I did until I started kind of looking back. And for my 11th birthday, um, I asked my parents to buy me a telescope from where we used to get that kind of stuff back then was off a shopping channel called QVC. And at that point, like buying things, uh, from the television was a thing for some reason. I'm not quite sure why. It's better to do it on the internet, so keep doing that. Um, but looking back, yeah, I was really interested in astronomy. I used to run Dinosaur Club when I was in uh, in um, uh, in primary school when I was very young. That my friends would come round and I'd give them homework about dinosaurs. So I always thought that I was a uh, just one of the sporty kids because I used to do. Uh, basketball and rugby and soccer and um, squash and badminton and rock climbing and all the rest of it. But it turns out that I w was one of the, the more geeky kids, really. I was really interested in um, how science worked, how just how the world works. And later down the line, it came to a point where I was like, I could do both of these together. I can use sports and, um, and physical uh, awareness and training and whatnot to help me get to some different locations where I can explore the world a bit better. So I used to work at a, a science center in the UK uh, called TechniQuest where we just have fun with science and we'd kind of explore new things and it kind of got into it through that. Um, and then one day I said to myself, I really want to mix all my passions together and start, a, start my own company, start a business out of it. And it's not always the that you get to to do what what you your dream job for a living. Um, I think I do, but I would have a, I would have a lot of dream jobs. I would I would love to be uh, a doctor. I would love to be a conservationist. I would love to be an astronaut. I would love to be a, a pilot. I would love to be the rest of it. So I'm lucky that I get to do what I do because if I won the lottery, I would still do it again tomorrow. But I, I think I'm one of the people who would enjoy doing lots of different things um so if you can be kind of curious about the world and enjoy learning things then whatever career you fall into you'll probably end up loving it all right and Hugh I think you'd probably agree that a lot of people do have passions and things that excite them but they're able to talk themselves out of it or yeah back away from taking the risk and that's that's not the way to do it you've got to You've got to take those chances. You've got to go after what you love and sometimes just jump in with both feet and, and yeah. trust that it will work out. Yeah, same kind of thing, but being risk away, not risk averse. Like uh, even in, in business, it's the same thing. You've got to be aware of, you know, like investing in things to try and gain in from it later on and all that. And I spent, you know, quite a bit of my time. I was just doing my some of my tax returns before jumping on a call with you guys. It's got to be done. Um, it's part of, part of the part of the world, but um, it just means that it's uh, those little things, like I don't really enjoy doing tax returns, but for the rest, 
for the rest of my year then i get to do really exciting stuff and, and live my dreams so it's fine <laughs> All right. And I do have a question from uh, Mrs. Woods Five Sixes in Toronto. They're curious about the best and the worst part of what you do. Ah, worst textions. <laughs> um, that's a good question. I don't really have many worst things. Probably the worst thing is being away from home so much. I'm quite lucky at the moment that I am home, but I go back maybe 10 days ago. And I go away again in two days time um, for two weeks. So I do miss home quite a lot. I love my country. I love Wales uh, and I love my friends. They've been fr my friends since I was four years old. So I'm quite lucky that I've grown up with them and get to spend more time with them. Um, but I live in a, a very kind of sleepy Welsh town um, for 8,000 people live in it. And um, I think we're, we're in a we're in a valley, um, and at the end of the valley is the is the ocean, or is the our capital city. And if I if I didn't do what I do, I wouldn't get out that much, so I wouldn't get to see the world. I would um, I would not know about other cultures, meet people who speak other languages. Uh, I wouldn't meet people who look different. You know, my uh, my county around here um, is ninety eight point seven percent white. Um, so I wouldn't get to people meet people who look different to me. So, but hands down, the best thing about what I do is is travel. Uh, is I get to meet wonderful people from all around the world, uh, and have my eyes opened to a global community uh, of lots of different people who um, believe in different things, who look different, who speak different, but ultimately are all human. Um, and yeah, I think, but but. Conversely, the best thing about it is going away, and the worst thing about it is going away um, because I do miss home quite a lot. All right, good answer. I like that. I like the way you did that. Uh, let's swing through some classrooms and see if we can steal a couple more questions. Let's go back to British Columbia uh, with Mrs. Caesar's grade sixes. And see if they have another question. Hey. Hi. Have you ever had any major injuries? Oh, that's, a, that's one that comes up every now and then. Um, funnily, um, my wife is currently on the sofa downstairs with, uh, she just had surgery on her pinky finger because um, she got speared through the pinky finger with a, by a sea urchin um, on our trip scuba diving uh, back, back about 10 days ago. Uh, so on my, on my last trip away, I managed to not get injured, but my wife got speared and she just had surgery yesterday um, with a, by a sea urchin. So yeah, quite a few times, none of which really are were, were super bad. Um, I am fairly good at making sure that I, I try and stay away from really, really risky situations. Been once or twice where I've, I've got away and thought, you know, I've been lucky there. I, I never want to come away from situations where, you know, you go onto a glacier or you go up into the top of a mountain or you go scuba diving for sure. And then you come back and you go, I was lucky. You, you don't want to be lucky. You want to be well prepared uh, and aware of the risks that, that you're taking. So uh, a few times, little, little things like you can see that that finger doesn't point the right direction, that that pinky finger kind of rears off to the, to the side. I broke it snowboarding uh, a while back. And two of my biggest ones were uh, rock climbing, where um, I was climbing and the, and the rocks were kind of weren't really um, as stable as they should be. And I fell about 12 meters and hit the ground um, and damaged my leg uh, quite a bit. And then another one was was when I was training to be a scuba diver, um, and my tanks weren't open all the all the way. Um, and it's a good bit of advice for you that if you go scuba diving, open your tank all the way because my air ran out uh, about 18 meters down. Um, as I was training, as I was learning, it was my, my instructors that were opening the air tanks, but I should have double checked them um, because in those kind of situations where, you know, if you go out for a walk maybe, or if you go in lots of different places, if you're not fully prepared, you can kind of get away with it. But in situations where you kind of go into the high mountains, or down to the in uh, down in the ocean, 
you ha you can't get away with being you know just by learning the the, the bare minimum you kind of got to know and prepare um, because if you don't then it's you that suffers nobody else uh, so I w I'm, I've been I say I've been lucky I've been I've been prepared for most of my stuff and I, I make sure that if I go up a mountain so I'm, I'm off uh, in March to climb Mount Tukal which is the the largest uh, mountain in, in Africa I've trained for a long time done lots of different training to make sure that not only can I go up and back down again if everything's good but also if something goes wrong then hopefully I've got the training to, to get myself and my team off that off that mountain I always try and think that if everything goes okay anyone can get away with anything but it's if things go bad that your training kicks in and your preparedness also kicks in all right well hugh i wish uh we could just keep going all afternoon but uh unfortunately we're getting towards the end of our hangout so if it's okay with you if any classes do have some more questions maybe they can send them my way and i can forward them on to you and, yeah uh, for sure i would love that perfect we can do it that way so classrooms thank you so much for joining us today as always your questions are awesome uh, great to have you with us from all over Canada and the U.S. And Hugh, of course, thank you for letting us steal some of your time. I know it's precious. Um, we're excited to actually. That's a good question. How can we follow your adventures, Hugh? So uh, have a look on Antirus, which is a, a Welsh word. It's spelled A-N-T-U-R-U-S. You had a very good pronunciation of it earlier. Um, and it's adventurous education. So we're trying to put all of our the resources that we make for schools, videos that we're just changing so you can download them and use them in your, in your classroom and have a look. Um, so Antiris, we're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and on our website too. Um, and hopefully uh, we'll be doing more of these throughout the year as well. All right, sounds like a plan, we're game. Uh, once again, classrooms, thank you so much. Let's thank turn the so mic on, let's get nice and loud and uh, say goodbye and thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks again, everyone. Don't forget to send those questions in if you have some more. You enjoy uh, your time at home and safe travels in the field. Thanks so much, Mr. Grabowski. See you soon. All right, thanks everyone.